very much for being here with us tonight. My name is Penny Wright. Some of you we know, and we have some new faces in our audience. We're delighted to have all of you here. Tonight is the last evening, the last session, I should say, in our summer writer series, and we're particularly pleased to have a distinguished author here tonight. His name is Thomas Mayer, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him before we get started. He is an author, journalist, and television producer. His book, Masters of Sex, The Life and Times of William Masters and Virginia Johnson, The Couple Who Taught America How to Love, is the basis for the award-winning drama, Masters of Sex, which premiered on Showtime in 2013. Most recently, he's the author of When Lions Roar, The Churchills and the Kennedys, the first comprehensive history of the two dynastic families, which is published by Crown, and which we hope to have him here to speak about at a later date. His other books include The Kennedys, America's Emerald Kings, a multi-generational history of the Kennedy family, and the impact of their Irish Catholic background on their lives, and Dr. Spock, An American Life, which was named a notable book of the year in 1998 by the New York Times, and which is the subject of a BBC and an arts and entertainment biography documentary. His 1994 book, New House, All the Glitter, Power, and Glory of America's Richest Media Empire and the Secretive Man Behind It, won the Frank Luther Mott Award, which was presented by the National Honor Society in Journalism and Mass Communication as Best Media Book of the Year. Thomas Mayer joined Newsday in 1984, when he was just a tiny tot, no. <laughs> <laughs> after working at the Chicago Sun-Times. He's won several top honors, including the National Society of Professional Journalists Top Reporting Prize, twice, the National Headliner Award, the Worth Bingham Prize, and the New York Deadline Club. In 2002, he won the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists Top Prize for a series about immigrant work workplace deaths. At the Columbia University Graduate School of Journal Journalism, he won the John M. Patterson Prize for television documentary making and later received the John McCloy Journalism Fellowship to Europe. Thomas Mayer holds a BA in political science from Fordham University in the Bronx he lives in Huntington. It is a great pleasure to have him here with us. Please welcome Tom Stanley. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming on such a beautiful night tonight. I hope nobody had any uh, power outages or any of the, the, uh, the rain problems that we had this morning. Um, how many folks get the chance to see the show? Can I just raise? Oh, oh that's really good. Uh, next week I'm going out to Los Angeles. Uh, I'm going to go on the set, set my uh, my lovely bride. Uh, she and I are going alone without the three kids and the kids, the three sons dragging along. And we're going to go on the set so uh, and the te television critics all come out next week. So uh, uh, they have a lot of parties and such. So. Um, when I go out there, I'll make sure I said I said that at the Rogers Library in Southampton that so many people raised their hand when I asked about <laughs> watching the show. That'll that'll make Michelle Ashford, who's the showrunner, very very happy. You know, as I mentioned before, um, I have three <laughs> sons, and when the subject of sex comes up, and as we all know, uh, sex is a very complicated thing. In many ways. Sex was defined uh, for me by Dr. Spock, the famous baby doctor who was kind of like the recipient of the end product of sex. But he was trained by uh, all these Freudians, and he said, uh, I remember at one point he said, sex is everything. You know, and of course, anybody who's been trained in Freud, of course, that, that, that was that whole view about that. But you know, it's more than just the, the, the physical aspect of the act of the progression of the species that we really want to 
have a fancy and long-term view of what sexuality is about. Um, it's also about the communication. It's who we are. You know, oh, it's a boy. It's a girl. Dr. Spock when you hold up, you know, a, a newly born infant. Uh, so you know, sexuality defines us. Uh, with three sons, it's uh, often been it's been uh, my job as the dad to give the talk. And because um, we have three boys, uh, they played a lot of soccer, but minivans, which I know is, are now out of style, you know, everybody's got these new type of vans. But back in the day, you know, 20 years ago, um, I found that going to soccer games where you'd have to go for like a, you know, 45 minutes in the car, there's a good spot to give the talk. And I realized that the talk, you know, because you're driving like this, and your kid's right next to you, and they, you know, they're kind of a captive audience. So, um, and you realize there's more than one aspect of the talk. You know, the talk can kind of begin with hair under the arms and stuff like that, you know, some of the, some of the physiological aspects of it. But then as you go on in life, and as hopefully you give more than just a mechanical explanation uh, about intimacy, human intimacy to your children, that the talk has more than just one chapter to it. Um, that it has um, the elements of how we communicate, and, and, and often in the most intimate ways. Um, and so uh, a lot of this book, Masters of Sex, and if you, I'm sure you noticed, I uh, had a lot of very long subtitles in my book. This has a, a almost insufferably long subtitle as well. But it did say the couple who taught America how to love, and it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek uh, in saying that, because you know we, Dr. Spock was one of the great how-to books. You know, we Americans, we love to have advice books and how-to books and such. Uh, and of course, Spock's was probably the greatest selling how-to book ever. Uh, but Masters and Johnson, what they wanted to do, particularly Bill Masters, was introduce the idea of med bringing medicine into the conversation about sexuality. And you know, and as I said, when you talk about um, when you give the talk as a parent, you know, we're, we're, we live in a society today that is awash in imagery. And, and you know, ads for Viagra, things of that nature. You know, everybody knows everything, all the mechanical aspects of sexuality. And it seems as though people are even more clueless about love than ever before. You know, 50, 60 years ago when Masters and Johnson started, people were clueless about the mechanical aspects, the how-to of, of uh, human intimacy. Uh, but we had kind of, actually more conversation, at least about a romanticized love, you know, the, the love that we would see <laughs> on a screen like this at the movie theater. Um, so what Masters did, he was an OBGYN who, <laughs> realized that uh, he traveled in a circle with a number of doctors who were winning Nobel Prizes, discovery of estrogen, progesterone. But what he realized was that there had never been a documentation of human sexuality, of exactly how it works. Not, you know, not the perceptions of it, not the, the wives' tales about it, but the very specific things, the way a scientist would look at things. And as he was determined that medicine should be part, really at, at the, the heart of conversation about human sexuality, you know, a lot of couples who would seek to have children sometimes would have difficulties. And that's how Master started as an OBGYN. Uh, he was a fertility expert initially. And that's how he got involved in all of this. And so as he developed that specialty as an OBGYN and then the subspecialty of fertility, he realized 
if I am the one to document exactly soup to nuts how things work sexually, I will win a Nobel Prize. I'll be the Christopher Columbus of human sexuality. And every time he, he you know, it was a very natural, intellectual, uh, curious thing to come up with. And when he voiced that to his mentors and the professors at the medical school, Johns Hopkins, I said, oh no, Bill, don't want to go there. We'll watch how the rabbits do it. We'll watch how uh, the apes may do it. But it's, you're playing with nitroglycerin. You can't do that. Uh, and so uh, there was a one particular professor at Johns Hopkins that was very well known in the field. Uh, uh, George Washington Corner was his name. No less than George Washington. And he told me, Bill, he said, you know, if you're going to do this, you got to be a married man. You have to have a, an accomplished practice. You have to be working in a medical school uh, in a responsible position. And only then can you really think about beginning to do this. And so uh, Masters, after about 10 years out at Washington University in St. Louis, began the study of human sexuality, pushed out the boat. And he said he felt very strongly that medicine should be, as I mentioned, should be at the forefront. You know, that couple, married couples, particularly those having, wanting to have children, or having any type of difficulties in the bedroom. They would seek the, the advice of uh, perhaps a Freudian trained psychoanalyst and be on the couch talking about how you, how you, your feelings about mom, you know, for some, or you go see uh, the rabbi or the minister, or Father McGillicuddy at the local parish, and you'd ask Father McGillicuddy for his advice. I say that as a uh, Fordham man, I with all due respect to the church. Uh, and actually, the guy who's the bishop in St. Louis, which was a uh, pretty heavily Catholic town, actually, uh, was delighted that he was doing this. He didn't want to endorse it, but this got the priests, you know, off the hook in many ways. This was something, if Bill did this study and the, did this textbook and was able to explain things uh, particularly sexual dysfunction. They coined the phrase sexual dysfunction. We hear it in all the ads these days, you know, whatever. But they were really the first ones to do that. Uh, and so, as if he was coming up with the atomic bomb uh, or playing with nitroglycerin, he eventually convinced people to allow him to do the study. And so what I'd like to do is start uh, with a clip, which I hope I can hit from here, uh, let's just see if it's we're working here. Not, I'll move over a little bit. So I'm going to start with, uh, let's see if I can do this. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm going to introduce here uh, Dr. Masters. Uh, and this is a scene from the pilot. I should mention for those Long Islanders, um, <coughs> pardon me, the pilot for the show was filmed here uh, in New York on Long Island. Uh, and this was filmed at Sands Point, the scene that I'm about to show you. So without any further ado, this is Michael Sheen, uh, star of Masters of Sex. Uh, in this, uh, it was really the first time that you are introduced to Bill Masters. Yes. 
standard in the Midwest, the higher standard, so high that even our friends on the coast are now paying attention. <laughs> The man that we're honoring this evening is a visionary in every sense of the word. And I've known him since he was a resident here in Washington. He was opinionated and hard-headed even then. <laughs> His constant innovations to obstetric surgery have earned him dominance in the field. If there's one thing I hear during the course of my day, it's thanks to him we have a family. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. William Masters. Behind the drama of the show itself was another drama as well, and it's how the book isn't uh, was uh, uh, adapted by television. The my book came out in 2009, and um, it was reviewed in the Friday New York Times, the Daily Review, and then that Sunday, so the following week, we had a number of different people who. Uh, wanted to buy the rights to the book and make it into something. And there were a few people, I knew I didn't want to do anything, you know, Masters of Sex, I have three teenage sons, thanks but no thanks, I wasn't interested. But um, I, a couple of people wanted to make a movie out of it. Uh, but uh, what happened was that there was a woman named Sarah Timmerman who was a producer at Sony Pictures and she had been a book editor at Random House and said, you know, Tom, I know you're thinking about a movie and that this should be a movie. Uh, and I was telling that to my agent. She said, but you should really think about this golden age of television, Mad Men and all these other different programs and such. Uh, we live in this new, uh, really, <clears throat> device or whatever, of the narrative storytelling on cable television particularly. Uh, and we'd like to make this into a, a series. And so um, that was also part of the drama of this whole thing as, it, as it's gone on. Um, Masters didn't look anything like Michael Sheen in, in, in the physical sense. Although in Michael's um, defense, he offered to shave his head uh, so that it would have a degree of verisimilitude, as they say. Uh, person, though, who actually is a lot like Virginia Johnson is Lizzie Kaplan, uh, the actress who plays uh, Virginia in the show. And, um, you know, it's, it, it was uh, a part of the joy of doing this book was interviewing people who were Bill Masters contemporaries, doctors, OBGYNs, residents who had worked with Dr. Masters. Uh, but talked about that time period in the 50s and the 60s when they were getting this study off the ground and knew them. And they all said to me, uh, the ones that were still alive, uh, how much Lizzie Kaplan really uh, 
resembles Virginia Johnson, the real Virginia Johnson from that time period. So who was Virginia Johnson? Well, when she comes through the door, uh, in the scene that we just saw with Dr. Masters, where he's going, the only resembles uh, Groucho Marx, hello, hello, I must be going, I must be going. Uh, well, off he goes, he's not going to deliver a baby. What he's going is to a local brothel to where it's been arranged by, uh, with the, the approval of the police commissioner in St. Louis, a guy named Sam Priest, no less. Uh, and he adored Masters because Dr. Masters uh, 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 delivered all the babies for Mrs. Priest. So, you know, the way that people just love their doctor, a great doctor, uh, the police commissioner kind of looked the other way as Masters is doing this study. And he, he realized what, uh, that he couldn't, after a period of time, that mm -hmm. the, the, the experiences of prostitutes were not comparable to the average woman and that it would, you know, that it would knock down whatever findings that he would see in their study. So he realized in a scene that just follows this, that one of the prostitutes tells him, uh, buddy, you need a, uh, a female partner. There's actually another story related to that, but I won't go into it. Today's crowd. But basically, she says, well, you know, Dr. Masters, you may be an OBGYN, but there's certain things about women you still don't seem to understand. And you really need to get a female partner. So in the 50s, when Masters started, there weren't many female doctors to begin with. And you weren't going to medical school so that you could fool around after hours with some maybe crazy doctor with this thing that was essentially suicide. If you were playing with, as I mentioned, nitroglycerin, you would go watch people doing what? After hours in our medical school? Are you crazy? Uh, so of course the female doctors didn't want to go there. Bill Masters, um, you know, the, the old adage, doctor heal thyself. Well, actually, he had a low sperm count. He never told that to his wife. When they had difficulty getting uh, had to, uh, getting pregnant, his wife had difficulty getting pregnant, kind of intimated that it was her fault. Not, and never told, and I found that out actually because of a study that he and another doctor did, and the other doctor told me, so you know Bill had a low sperm count. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason why I mention that is um, uh, they had eventually, the Masters had two children as a result of uh, Masters tech fertility techniques. So that the idea of Dr. Hill himself, he, you know, he, he kind of solved his own uh, problems in terms of trying to have children uh, by coming up with these uh, cutting edge fertility techniques. But his wife, because they had now, now had two children, didn't want to get involved in the study as well. So he was looking for a female partner, and the study basically was on hold, and it looked like it was going to die. And his great dream of winning a Nobel Prize would be thwarted until a 32-year-old woman, twice married, recently divorced, with two children of her own, decided to go back to college, uh, back to Washington University. And to help pay the bill, she got a job as a secretary at the medical school. Actually, Virginia Johnson, uh, she didn't even work in an office. She worked in the, she worked in the, uh, the uh, hallway of one of the, outside the offices. You know, one of those old metal desks and such. She's filling out insurance forms. And somehow, some way, she becomes uh, the partner for Masters. And uh, this is uh, the clip of Lizzie Kaplan, introduced in which uh, the character of Virginia Johnson is, is introduced.
Dr. Masters, we haven't yet met. Are you here to interview? Or on some other business? Can you squeeze me in now? I'm sure it seems unorthodox going from nightclub secretary to secretary, but I can assure you I am very capable, organized. I'm the hardest worker I know. You don't know me. Well, I see that comes with the job. A medical education. I was an undergrad at Drury College. Studying? Music. So you graduated with a BA. Actually, marriage interfered before I could graduate. But I am enrolled in classes now here at the university. I'll have my degree by year's end. In? Sciences. Behavioral science. Interference. You didn't want to get married? Are we talking about my husband's again? So there's more than one? Two. I stopped at two. So, first marriage was for interference. Second was for... Children. I have a boy and a girl. Is that unusual? I believe that's average. Statistics. Is it unusual that you be married for love and need a marriage? I used to round up by women. Perhaps you could best answer that question. I'm curious as to what you have to say. Well, good housekeeping courses tell you that women marry for love. What they think is love. But I think that. Women often confuse love with physical attraction. Sex? Yes. Women often think that sex and love are the same thing, but they don't have to be. They don't even have to go together. Sex can be perfectly good on its own, whereas love is... I don't think I've ever heard a woman express such an opinion. This is not a theory I trot out at dinner. Did she live, the woman in surgery today? Yes. And when she died, did you not step down? Yes. Then I am you. That's the day well spent. They were very strict about my break. Since you uh, the subject of sex. Actually, you did. Uh, why would a woman fake an orgasm? To get a man to climax? Okay. Usually so the woman could get back to whatever it is she'd rather be doing. Virginia Johnson, and um, you know, when they made, I'm telling some tales out of school here, in fact, I wasn't even in the, in the room when it happened, but they originally uh, announced that a different actor prior to Sheen uh, was going to be Dr. Masters, and this is about three years ago, and uh, they had a table reading here in New York. And so much of the show is about chemistry. Uh, and the chemistry, it was very clear that the chemistry wasn't working between Lizzie Kaplan, as Virginia Johnson, and this other actor. And this other actor is a very uh, well-connected actor. Uh, it's a, you can look it up. <laughs> uh, but uh, the John Madden, uh, did Shakespeare in Love, the movie that won the Oscar back in 1998. He was the director for this pilot. And he's a British gentleman who um, has done a number of different television productions as well. So there they were, they were stuck. And usually when something like that happens, the whole thing you know, isn't going to work. That, that they may not, the ship may not get off the ground. And so uh, Madden took a copy of my book to London with it. He said, I think I know who could play Masters and be the right person for it. And he went to London and Michael Sheen was on the stage, the little the little bit, doing Hamlet. <laughs> and said, uh, you know, basically, dear boy, you should be doing this. And 
uh, Michael thought about it long and hard and then finally said yes under one condition. Uh, it turns out he has a 14-year-old daughter uh, with the, the actress Kate Beckinsale, beautiful woman, uh, who, um, and their daughter lives with Kate out in Los Angeles. So he said, my terms is I will agree to be Dr. Masters, but we, we'd like to film it in Los Angeles. So that was a great tragedy for me because, of course, they filmed the pilot here on Long Island, and I just thought that maybe I could bring a few more jobs to Long Island uh, if they stayed here and filmed it. Um, what happened from there, though, is that Virginia was kind of the yin to Masters Yang, that if Bill was the hard science guy, the man, the very serious fellow, Virginia had a way of, you know, uh, understanding how human beings tick, uh, of, and even more importantly, convincing women to become part of their study, not prostitutes, but nurses and uh, secretaries, uh, the top guy at Washington University. His secretary was a, a part of their study and such. And, and um, some of the people that were also uh, familiar with his OBGYN practice. But it was really Virginia Johnson who convinced so many women to become part of their study. And for that, um, although it, the story kind of begins almost like a Pygmalion story of you know the professor and the lowly secretary, Virginia Johnson had a certain genius about human nature. And uh, she was the one who developed their therapies that became the uh, that was adopted uh, therapies that were adopted by medical s schools, taught in medical schools. Virginia never got her degree. You know, you saw that scene where she's coming in, and it's a light motif of, you know, I'm going to go back to my degree. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to do it someday. It never really happened. But um, Masters, amazingly gave her equal credit. And it was probably Bill Masters' greatest act of love that he shared, eventually shared credit with Johnson. But it was also very well earned because if it wasn't for Virginia, the study of how things work uh, wouldn't have been uh, possible without her intervention. And their second book, which was basically geared towards therapies that when, when there were problems, how to fix the problems. In other words, first have, understand how things work, and then how, so that medicine can come up with therapies to fix whatever problems it is that pa patients are having. And it was really, that, it was that second thing, the therapy, that was uh, Virginia's uh, genius. She, she read widely, part of it was consulting urologists, part of it was reading a lot about uh, what is now called uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. But uh, um, for that, Masters really loved her. Uh, what I'd like to do is just show uh, just, um, the study. There's, um, now we're running a little long here, but I just, I'd just like to show at least one more clip. I'll deliver these on my break. Let the messenger boys do that. Oh, get out. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Yes, please. Sorry there. Got to fire the AV. Dr. Masters. <laughs> here to bring me. Or on some other business. Mouse, a mechanical phallus. What we've done here is revolutionary. You know it is. 
not just the technology. The, the new data we're collecting dispels years of myths about how a woman's body anticipates sex. We've already debunked many of Freud's theories, plus charted clear-cut stages of sexual response, for and all. We're starting to see that some women are capable of multiple orgasms. Why does your secretary keep talking to me? I already gave you my answer. It's not an answer I can accept. I've made this hospital a fortune. Our patient base is tripled. We're ranked second in the country. Our donors can't write checks fast enough in large part because of me. You know, I got us to where we are now. And this study, this is where we're going. This is the future. But if you won't support me in, in blazing that trail, then I'll find another hospital who will. Dangerous game you're playing. Oh, it's not a game. I need that by the end of today. <clears throat> You there? <clears throat> Thought you'd broken that off. Broken what off? We're friends. Because our professionalism and standards have to be beyond reproach. This is not research into kidney disease, which might survive some incident in a departmental scandal. This study is the scandal. So even a hint of impropriety could. You read all our work now, everything's to come. I understand you're upset about Scully. I'm not talking about Scully. I'm given that every museum in the world is filled with art, created from this basic impulse. The greatest literature, and the most beautiful music. The study of sex is the study of the beginning of all life. And science holds the key. Yet we sit huddled in the dark, like prudish caves, filled with shame. And then... Guilt. <coughs> and the truth is, nobody understands sex. And now nobody will. killer off the hook. It's actually uh, a phone call saying that they can go ahead with the study, uh, as only Hollywood can, you know, dramatize these things. Um, you know, I have to say a, a quick word about Bo Bridges. I am he's such a delightful guy, uh, and he's just been, he's uh, nominated again this year for an Emmy, along with Allison Janney, who's in our show as well. And uh, last year, Allison won the Emmy for her portrayal as uh, Martin Scully is the name of Bo's character. Uh, and so Allison won the Emmy for that. And Mark, I'm hoping this year is the year for Bo Bridges that he wins the Emmy. It's certainly well deserved, in my, in my opinion. And it actually was filmed at Brooklyn College, just FYI. You know, I just kind of pulling it together here, and I'd like to get to some questions of, at least since so many people have watched the show, I'm sure you have some questions. But I'd like to just kind of wrap it up, if I may, by emphasizing something that I began with, which is the whole subject of love. Um, you know, it's just interesting that the, the show, we all agreed, should start a certain way, uh, which is about like chapter seven in the book. But my book actually is written more chronologically, and it begins with Virginia. It's just before World War II. And I asked her basically, who is your great love of your life, or at least your young life? And in a roundabout way, 
than a biographer will ask the, you know, the type of questions that only biographers really can get at the heart of. Basically, I was asking, like, asking her, how did you lose your virginity? And she said, well, there was the boy with fiery red hair, uh, and he, everybody thought we'd get married someday. And, but it was just before World War II, and, it, uh, and he was a farm boy. And uh, I didn't want to stay in Golden City, population 800. She lived in the outskirts of Golden City. That's how far, far uh, and quiet this farmland was from Virginia. So she didn't want to have anything to do with the farm. She wanted the big city, the big, big lights. And she was headed that way. So that's the beginning of the book. And, and, and for a long time, Virginia wouldn't tell me who the boy with fiery red hair was. As a matter of fact, one of the members of the audience here has met my youngest son has a little bit of red hair, but my two older boys actually do have fiery red hair. So when she said, you know, I've lost my virginity to uh, the boy with fiery red hair, that kind of uh, threw me for a loop there for a moment. Um, but what I learned was that Virginia, of course, goes on and she becomes internationally famous. She's on the cover of Time magazine as the great sex expert. And they kind of realize that perhaps things were a little bit too much one way in terms of sex and not enough love. And by the 70s, Masters and Johnson wrote a book about, about love and about the, the, the importance of respecting one's partner and such. But Virginia Johnson's life, like Bill's, was a very, shall we say, complicated situation. Uh, they, they were not married. Uh, then they did get married. Uh, later on, they were married for 20 years. And at the end of their marriage, on Christmas Eve, after the rest of the family had left them, Bill went upstairs, and Virginia followed him. And that's when he announced, after 20 years of marriage, they were well into their 60s, I think he was in his 70s, he announced that he had found his lost love from his, high, from his early days, a, kind of a, a, a lover's quarrel that had happened 50 years ago. And he told Virginia, I'm divorcing you, and I'm going to get married to my beloved Dodie, was her name. Wow, wow. Dodie. This is, big, this is a big spoiler alert, excuse me. Um, so Virginia goes looking for her lost love, the boy with fiery red hair. And she still wouldn't tell me what his name was. You know, there's a certain amount of, when you're doing a biography like this, there's a certain amount of a, a fan dance that you get with the subject. Dr. Spock did it. You know, you kind of keep on asking questions. And they're a public figure. They know what their public image is. But they don't really want to talk sometimes about their personal lives. Virginia said that she would answer every question. But she wasn't going to always give me the information. So she did a little bit of a fan dance on the boy with, who's the boy with fiery red hair? So eventually, I called the library in Golden City. And they said, oh, yeah, you know who you should talk to? There's a guy named Lowell Pugh, is his name. Lowell Pugh. And well, who's Mr. Pugh? Mr. Pugh is the funeral home director in Golden City, Missouri, southwestern corner of the state there. Uh, and so I get a hold of Mr. Pugh. I said, hello, Mr. Pugh. Explain what I was doing. He said, oh, yeah, sure. I knew Virginia. She was quite a young lady and all that type of stuff. Uh, you know, it's all the guys. 50 years later, they said, oh, yeah, Virginia. It was like they were talking about Ava Gardner. Yeah. Uh, and to some extent, they were. Uh, but um, it, the, the memory was still fresh in their minds. And so uh, I said, yeah, Mr. Pew, one what of what these questions that I have, though, is, you know, Virginia said that she had a boyfriend in high school. He, he had said that he knew her from high school. I said, uh, we had fiery red hair. He said, oh, yeah, I know him. That's Gordon Garrett. 
<laughs> Gordon Garrett, really? Are you sure? I said, sure, I'm sure. I have the yearbook. It's in the yearbook. Predicted that Virginia Eshelman, later Virginia Johnson, Virginia Eshelman would get married to Gordon Garrett, and they they moved to Chicago and lived happily ever after. So when Bill Masters announced on Christmas Eve that it was leaving her for his beloved, lost love of his youth. You know, and Proust couldn't come up with something like this. Mm -hmm. She decides to go back to you know, find the memories, the lost love, the boy with fiery red hair. Whatever happened to Gordon Garrett? And eventually I found out, I found Gordon's two sisters. And the farm boy didn't stay on the farm. Uh, World War II came along, and what happened to Gordon Garrett is at the end of the book, and you'll have to read it <laughs> to find out what happened to Gordon Garrett. So, anyway, I thank you so much for coming this evening. I hope this has been enjoyable, and uh, I think it was delighted to take any questions that you have about either the book, about Masters and Johnson, or of course the show. I know that there was one person who already asked me a question. If you want to ask that question. Well, the question I asked was, at the end of the episode, it says that certain characters are fictitious. Yes. And I could never see the whole the children. thing. The children. Yes, not all of them. OK. There's a long explanation to that one. Uh, I'll give you the short version, relatively short version. About three years ago. There's the one word. That's the short answer. That is the short answer. Uh, whenever the lawyers get involved, look out. Uh, so it became a complicated thing. I know three years ago, uh, I got a phone call from Michelle Ashford, who's the showrunner of the show. She's the creator of the show. And this is her baby. I should make that very clear. I'm the author of the book. I'm a producer of the show. But that's really a name only. It's her baby. I gave the book. Uh, you know, when you sell the rights, uh, you understand it. To her credit and to the credit of her partner, uh, the co-executive producer, Sarah Timmer, they asked a lot, and I've been very much in, uh, involved in answering questions, basically being a consultant to the program. But about three years ago, Michelle called me and said, you know, we want to do more things with the children. And I said, well, you know, that was a sensitive subject with real life Virginia. Uh, because um, she was a workaholic, like a lot of men. She was a 24, seven days a week, 24 hours, seven days a week, a person who was determined to, to make this a great success. They were world famous, uh, and, but there were consequences at home. And so they wanted to, particularly now that her children, in the time that, that we're at right now, they wanted to deal with that in more complexity. And I do deal with it in the book, but you know it's a very dramatic thing. So um, I think we're victims of South Korea, frankly. This is my own speculation. But after the Sony, Sony is the producer of the show, mm -hmm. and after the Sony emails were hacked, hacked horribly so, really a disgrace, uh, I think everybody was very cautious legally. And so they decided to change names and do whatever so that Virginia, so that Michelle could dramatize the children and have the interactions at home, but also do it without any type of legal uh, consequences. So that's kind of the short answer to it. Yes, sir. Do you think this opens the door for uh, miniseries made uh, from any of your other books? Yes. Why aren't you nice? I didn't. Yeah. That, that, uh, yeah. You know, it's funny because. I think the singular achievement, aside from its its attributes as a drama, is that this uh, this show is used in um, a actual nonfiction book at, for a multi-season type of drama. You know, usually TV shows are either like Mad Men, the the invention of the creator, Matt Leiner, as an example, of Mad Men, or Breaking Bad, um, or they're usually based upon fiction. Uh, Game of Thrones, as an example, is based upon George R.R. R. Martin's novels. Uh, what they 
they did with this show is take my book, a non-fiction book, and do their own dramatic, and dr drama is by definition a fiction, but they, they did their own interpretation of it. And so, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I have another book that was 20 years old. It's about uh, the Condé Nast media empire, Tina Brown, Anna Wintour, the late 50s, late uh, 50s, 80s, thank you. Um, and Sony bought that, and um, it's going to be on Bravo. They announced it about two months ago, and it should be on, hopefully in Bravo in about a year or so. Uh, so thank you for asking. Yes, ma'am. I should know the answer to this question, but I don't. Did they win the Nobel Prize? No. Um, you know, in the first, the end of the first season, one of the more comedic scenes, in a way, in my book, um, is that Bill Masters has done this, you know, he, and he says, you know, on a Friday afternoon, the doctors would have uh, grand rounds, is what they would call it. It basically would show what the, which each, uh, each uh, study that each major doctor was doing. This is a medical school. <laughs> this is supposed to be one of the, you know, the top schools in the Midwest. So he's finally ready to show what they've been up to, to a group of male OBGYNs. Basically how female sexuality works. This is not, this is not a tangent to what their occupation is. And so he's up, just like I am here, showing in a screen exactly in living color, Kodak, Kodachrome, under you know, seal of whatever, but very secret about it. He finally shows his peers, and he thinks they're going to say, Bill, you're a genius. And uh, the reaction of his fellow doctors was not exactly what he was expecting. And so, in, in the sense that when we expect great things and you slip on a banana peel, uh, there was a, a little comedic aspect to that. But it was also, in its own way, kind of tragic, because uh, it sets in motion a whole lot, number of things. And unfortunately, Masters and Johnson, despite the importance and the, the impact of their work, never, never got a cent of any type of government research money. Never, what really was never endorsed by academia, and uh, they were very much on their own. So, you know, the whole subject matter is kind of a Rorschach test. Even who likes the show, I still can't figure out exactly, you know, is there a profile of a person <laughs> that likes the show? I mean, I have enough I, I, an idea of who likes it in general, but I'm constantly amazed at who doesn't, doesn't like the show and, and who it appeals to. So. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a still in our society a very touchy subject. How many more years are you going to contract for for this show to run? Well, my contract, without getting into the whole thing, is that you know every year I get paid. Okay. Uh, uh, I think they're expecting that it will go six seasons. Good. So we're in the middle of season three, okay. and um, I think everybody would like to see it played out to its end. Uh, the finale that I kind of teased earlier with the boy with fiery red hair, um, I think that could be a great finale. I mean, TV shows are remembered by their finales, Sopranos, all these other things. That could be a great finale. I don't want to influence the writing of it at all. Just a thought, just a thought. I'm just, I'm just a humble Long Island author here, you know. Uh, but, Pretty good. It'd be pretty good. So I, I, I you know, little. I think six years is what they're hoping for. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's been. It says five years later when you started the seasons. Five years of pet. Yes. However, the age of those children, ten years of pet, easily, and, and then you added what changed the thing. What was the point? Well, the Why point you, was. You want to get the kids into it, but. You know, um, I, I think everybody involved with the program was concerned about that. To achieve what, what Michelle wanted to do dramatically, they had to do this. Yeah. Um, they, you know, as you go along, and as, as I mentioned, and this is, um, this is really the first TV series that really, and correct me if any, anybody has a better TV memory than I do, but I, I can't think of a nonfiction biography that's been a multi-series 
smoky season drama. Michelle won, Michelle Ashford won uh, the Emmy for John Adams, which was a miniseries on HBO. Uh, that was a big factor in why I wanted to do business with her. Um, but uh, not a season, you know. So um, they started the first season actually out of sync with the, the ages of the kids and the way they wanted to introduce the fertility problems. But that was actually more in the early 50s. So, <laughs> uh, with the third season, I think they wanted to write the age so that the kids, in reality, the kids were closer in age than it appeared in the first season. But he had two children. He had two children. To, to the third child was there, it was, um, we're still on tape. I was going to say, well, I'm going to say, it's, the, it's a legal thing. I'll tell you later what I think, you know, a little bit more money. Uh, but we're on tape. Um, yes, sir? Do you mention some Johnson's defined sex? Are you loved? No. They, they always searched often couldn't express it. Um, it has a lot of its comedic sides, but at the end, you know, it's pretty tragic. Um, and in many ways, later on, I think, what I'm looking forward to is like, next season and the fifth season, if God willing, there's, we go to six, but where they become equals. <coughs> and Virginia is really the boss. It's really amazing. Bill's, you can see him already this season, mm -hmm. stepping back and deferring to her. And then with the therapy, the therapy's their main money maker. So, and she's really the, the brains behind that. I mean, he's in there, there, there. It was always one plus one equals not only two or three or seven, it was 47 with the two, you know, one, the two of them together. But it was really her baby with the therapy. So she, for a while, she really was the boss. And some of the consequences of that, and that had, you know, uh, that, that's when they were married. And so, um, you know, when I interviewed Virginia, uh, she was in her age, early 80s, about 80 she was. Uh, yeah, that's right. And um, she said, oh, I never loved her. <laughs> Bullshit. You know, uh, you know. It, 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 she would say that. And then when I said to her, oh, you know that doctor in Philadelphia that was did that study on uh, low sperm counts? Uh, the doctor told me Bill had a low sperm count. Oh, no, he didn't. He was very f virile. I know, but Virginia, you know biology better than I do. And you know viril virility does not have anything to do with a low sperm count. Um, so, um, she always, they were mesmerized by each other from the, almost the day that they met each other. And even when they were angriest at each other uh, and deeply disappointed and things fell apart in a, almost a tragic way, they were still <coughs> defined by each other. When I went to, out to St. Louis, for a big seven hour in your face conversation with Virginia that we had kind of planned at the end of the thing. A lot of the questions you know, were easily disposed of, but they were like all the real key questions. I saved for this one particular visit, and she was living under the name of Mary Masters. It was almost like she, you know, something out of Grey Gardens or something. You know, she was almost like a recluse at that point. But there she is, she's in the phone book listed as Mary Masters. She's been divorced from the guy for five or seven years, but still very defined by him. And she's using Mary, which was her original name is uh, uh, Ma uh, Mary Virginia Eshelman. You know, and she, so she's still using, you know, almost like an alias. Uh, and so she, you know, she read, when she read my book, uh, we had chats afterwards. In fact, on her birthday, I would send her flowers every, every birthday after. And, uh, and we, you know, we chat and stay in contact. She was 
She was aware of the show. We talked about, even when I was doing the book, I said, well, you know, there, there were people who wanted to do a movie. Master said, no way, no way. But uh, she said, uh, she could see uh, Julian Woodward would play me, she yeah, would say. And Julian Woodward would play Bill. Well, maybe Robert Duvall. You know, or somebody like that. So I, I know that you know, people would say she liked the TV series. I think I know her well enough to know. She definitely would have loved it because the book really pulls them out of obscurity. I mean, now they're once again famous, but it kind of, they were, she was in the shadows. And, uh, but when, when the book came out, those chats that we had afterwards, um, I said, you know, when you read the book, a lot of people have said to me, I guess you really did love the guy. You know, Bill, you really did love Bill. And she said, yeah, I guess I did. So um, I think it's reflected in the book. But, um, you know, it, it was a very, very complicated thing. The other thing that really attracted me to the story was the idea of a man and a woman as a biography, as a window into so many themes in American life during that time period. And they never really got it quite right. They, you know, they had the answers, they had the how to. They taught America how to love. But they never got the, they couldn't do it themselves. They never really quite got it, you know? And so uh, it had its great triumphs. It also had its really tender tragedies as well. Well, Betty actually is a real character initially. Um, Betty was, if you may remember, I mentioned about um, a graduate student, actually, believe it or not, who was one of the women who were volunteers. Uh, and, but she was also this woman, as the story goes, was also a prostitute, at picking up some extra money or whatever. And she's the one who told her, you know, buddy, uh, you need a female partner. And he would often tell that story and, you know, to the best of my uh, reporting process, it was true as well. I don't even need to tell it often. But uh, Michelle, you know, the, the liberties of doing a drama is that you're able to take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I never thought that the show would be a documentary. Uh, I knew it was a drama, and I think that's the way it should and always should be judged. Uh, I think it's unique that they've used a, a, a nonfiction book as the source material. But at the end of the day, it's a drama. I'm a, you know, I'm a journalist uh, by training and by day. I worked for Newsday and had for 30 years. So I'm keenly aware that you know you don't gild the lily in your, your storytelling. Uh, you know it, when you say it's not fiction. <laughs> Everything in that book is uh, you know I have receipts for it, as they say. Well, almost all of it is tape recorded interviews. So, but the show. To interpret. That's what it is. Well, it seems cold and overbearing person as he portrayed. Yeah. Show. Yeah. Distinct yeah. He, he definitely had those difficulties. Virginia warmed him up. A lot. A lot. Uh, but he still had problems. And, and, and all the stuff, you know, they had a great particular episode last season uh, called The Fight, in which they were in a hotel room together. And Virginia tells the story of how she once loved this army captain during World War II. And I, you know, when I was watching it, I really had an outer body experience, as they say, because I remember Virginia telling me that story. And you know, you can write it as a writer on the printed page. But you know, when you, somebody tells you something that uh, you can actually, I can still hear Virginia's voice and, and such. And actually, I shared some my take interviews with Virginia with Lizzie. So I thought she did a really good job, but. Uh, Michael has tried to bring all of his training as a Shakespearean actor. That scene we just showed there where he did the soliloquy and, you know, all this. <coughs> Pardon me, that's right off the, uh, the stage of a, you know, a London Shakespearean stage. But yeah, he, he's interpreting it, but I think it's very true to who and what Bill was. Um, you know, it, he was hoping to kind of cure himself. Uh, to some extent, and uh, although it's a very interior drama with him, Virginia becomes a diva in many ways. Uh, he's a very tightly loved guy. The 
how many other guys his age look just like that? And I, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a, I think he's doing, Michael's done a brilliant job of, of interpreting that. And, and you know, I won't say, um, you know, when you have a buddy movie or when you have, you know, a, a partnership, uh, you know, um, Acton Costello, somebody's got to be the straight man, someone's the comedian. You know, Virginia's the diva, but Bill is a very tightly wound character, and her character is kind of defined by Bill. You were going to ask a question. Thank yes. you. Um, good evening. My name is Teresa Colby. I'm a huge fan of the show. Oh. I'm also thrilled to get that you're an alumnus of four universities, specifically the Roseville campus, because I am well. Oh, good so. for you. I, it was the Jesuits who actually got me in. It really was, believe it or not, but that's a whole other story. It's true. Um, sort of a cool follow-up to what everybody is asking you. I realized that when um, a book is brought to television, that certain things are fictionalized, that perhaps three characters are suddenly comprised into one to save time. But certain things are so <coughs> personal. I was just curious. Did Libby have an affair with a black man uh, during the civil rights era? Uh, was a Dr. Skull in closeted homosexual who tried to kill himself? Did, was a Shaw ran actually one of his? Uh, no, no, boys? yes. <laughs> so far. Okay, okay. So that's a good so Oh, the football, the football player that uh, lived next door that the poor wife got the. Um, yeah, the, it's, uh, kind of, yeah. it's kind of based on a real life character. It's kind of based on mm -hmm. Hold on. Um, oh, yes. they were talking about the Betty character. Did she actually become an administrator in this office, or they just had some fun with that? Uh, they had fun with that. They, they, they actually combined. So, as I said, it was uh, the prostitute, but also there was an accountant who I think they kind of used. And in the case of Libby, just to wrap this up, uh, uh, they didn't want to. They didn't want Libby to be a doormat. You know, a 1950s stereotypical. Uh, uh, I, you know, I would say if you read my book, uh, the portrayal of Libby is not as a doormat. She was typical of her time. She was typical of her time. There were a lot of other women who stayed at home with the kids. That was in many ways the ideal in the 50s. I think it would still be the ideal for a lot of people who get into the work world and oh my god, this is crazy. But um, uh, she was more like uh, the uh, Melanie character in Gone with the Wind. Okay. She was a very good person. And, you know, you keep on asking people, okay, what about a bad day with living? Did she ever have a bad day? And she was, but she was also aware of how important the study was to her husband. And ironically, the, the thing that's the most interesting is that Libby became friends with Virginia. Yes. And so the level of complexity, betrayal, uh, is just compounded because of that fact. They weren't rivals as much as they were, uh, you know, two women involved in Bill Masters' one life together. Hey, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for coming. I have a copy of the book if you'd like to the, uh, the first editions of the book. Um, so I'd, yeah, I'd be happy to sign a copy. So we'll send you back, but not before we give you. So if you take the Californians of Hollywood, right? <laughs> <laughs>